How can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. Today's interview is with Emily Zola Renee. Years ago, a class Emily signed up for was canceled last minute, and she ended up in a traditional broom making class. This serendipitous turn of events put her on the path to what would become a big love of her life, as well as her main livelihood. It's more than just how good it feels to make things with our hands. Emily has what she describes as a fierce devotion to the beauty of the ordinary. A special handmade broom meant for sweeping your floor can help transform the blah of an everyday chore into more of a ritual. And as Emily says, creates an everyday opportunity for slowing down and really being intentional. She is also a teacher of broom making workshops, an herbalist, and organizer of women rewilding gatherings. She reminds us that learning a new skill is an opportunity for us to be beginners again, to allow ourselves to really go for the things that light us up, and when the special creative slash growth opportunity presents itself, to have the courage to put your hand on the door and open it. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> My name is Emily Renee, and I am currently a broom maker and sharing my my love of this craft through classes and through handmade brooms that I make. I would say the biggest creative endeavor of my life has been my children up until this point, you know, birthing two children into the world and being primarily a stay-at-home Waldorf homeschool mom for a number of years has given me a lot of opportunity to, yeah, just tend like to create my life around creative endeavors through food, through daily walks and celebrations in nature and just like teaching my children to craft and to also just love this artistic element of life. I would also say that my whole life has been a creative project. Just I am so lit up by learning new things, whether it be herbal medicine or cooking or learning about plants or learning new earth skills. I just really find a lot of joy through learning. You're really, truly have the lifestyle mixed in with the work that you offer as your job, you know, exactly. so it's like you have creativity within your job, but also it's like very much all of your other, everything else. And then you're talking about the Waldorf program with your kids was that sort of an openness where you created your own projects and your own curriculum or did you have models to go off of? I mean, we loosely followed some models, but really it was like, how do we craft our life around the things that we wish to do and the cycles and the seasons of nature? You know, so there was such a focus on seasonal celebrations and uh, crafts related to like, okay, what can we find outside with the abundance of summer? Like, how can we turn the harvest of our garden into, you know, incredible meals? And how do we, you know, maybe we'll learn how to do natural dye, or maybe we'll, you know, go make like, I remember in the wintertime, we used to make these like really beautiful sculptures just with like ice, you know, with like different uh, like mandalas and things. And we would put them out in trays and put water on them and then hang them up in the like outside of our window. So it was just like, yeah, just like really looking to see what was inspiring us based on the cycles and the seasons of the earth. Is that what you had as a kid or did Definitely you like not? <laughs> no. Tell I us mean about that. <laughs> I was really fortunate. I grew up in northern Baltimore County, Maryland. And so I grew up in the country. My my school had cows and it was a, there was like a big agricultural program. So I just had like I spent a lot of time in nature as a kid. Still went to a pretty mainstream public school. But I feel like the world like my world was just so opened up by just all of the incredible 
places I had around me, you know, I would go visit the rivers and just go spend a lot of time in the woods. And I think that that's really what inspired a lot of my desire to just express myself creativity through this, like the portal of nature and all of the beautiful offerings that live there. So you felt like a very natural calling to it as a young child and you responded to the, that feeling basically. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the portal in was, I was really interested. I remember as a teenager in indigenous cultures I actually unenrolled for half of my senior year in high school to go live with my aunt and uncle in Mexico um, and just like learn about the culture down there. They lived uh, in a village with the Tarahumara Indians in the Copper Canyon area. And I remember like watching the women weave and just like learning about all of the traditional handcrafts that they did. And it just really opened my world up to all of the possibilities. So, so certainly like traveling in my late teens and early 20s was like a yeah a big opening for me as well and was it after that time that broom making came along as something that you fell in love with yeah broom making came along kind of by mistake (laughs) I mean nothing is ever by mistake but I was 25 and I had already had one I had had my first daughter when I was 22 and I was pregnant with my second daughter Tilia and I found about I found out about the John C. Campbell Folk School I applied for a scholarship and I got a scholarship I was really interested in learning how to do felt making and I had like set aside this whole week. I had gotten childcare. I had rented a place. And then I learned that the class got canceled. And so they told me like, okay, you can choose another class. It's happening this week. And I looked at the schedule and I saw broom making and was just like, that seems interesting. Like I'll give that a shot and just completely fell in love and went back two more times after that to take more broom making classes from other teachers I love that so much because it's like you had to work hard to create space for that. That's hard to do pregnant little kids. Um, And that you still, it didn't go the way you planned, but you still hung (laughs) with it. And then that like literally seriously changed your life. I mean, you've made a lot of brooms since then. And a lot of people have learned from you. People have bought them. You're like a broom making gal. (laughs) I love how it just kind of happened. Yeah, I love the way it happened. And it was funny because, I mean, my my family is from, my family has roots in West Virginia and Virginia. So, you know, definitely a strong Appalachian heritage. And um, about a year later, after I had taken my first broom making class, we still have our family's farmhouse up in West Virginia that was built in like the early 18, maybe late 1800s. But I was up in the attic one day and I found this bundle of broom corn and I brought it down and I was asking my dad about it. And he was like, oh yeah, I'm sure that your, I'm sure your great grandmother probably grew that. And then just shared with me the story of like many, you know, many Appalachian homesteads would just grow their own little plot of broom corn and they would just kind of bundle them together either with twine or wire or old fabric scraps. And they called them brush brooms and, you know, would just use them for whatever cobwebs or crumbs or the floor. So I actually took that little bundle of broom corn and I made it into a little ritual broom uh, that I use in my space just to honor my great grandmother and and that heritage. Was Carlson Tuttle one of your teachers? Carlson he was Tuttle. not actually. I have not learned from Carlson. I've met Carlson before because he's got, I know one of his homes at least is in Burnsville, not too far in Yancey County, not too far from where I live. My first teacher was Glenn McLean, who's Canadian, um, and Carol Morse, who used to be the resident broom maker at the Foxfire Museum in Georgia. Uh, Yeah, I love them both so dearly. And I think I taught my first broom making class maybe, maybe a year or two after taking that initial class with them. And I decided I was just going to go for it. I taught a sweeper broom making class, which if if you've ever taken a broom making class, like it's one of the hardest, you know, it's one of the most intricate and hardest brooms to make. But Glenn like really coached me through it. I remember calling him the day before class and being like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, help me, give me some advice. And I I did it and I learned a lot. Uh, And I've taught many classes since that time. And just like really appreciated, really appreciated him so much for just being such a big encouragement and mentor for me in my journey. 
that was going to be my next question. Have they had a chance to kind of see how much you've done since then, thanks to their influence? So it sounds like yes. <laughs> yes. It's been a few years since I've like, I stayed in touch with Glenn for a long time and he would occasionally comment on my social media, you know, posts and things just with encouraging words. But it's been a couple of years since I've, since I've spoken to him. I love the idea one teacher passes to the next teacher passes to the next teacher it's beautiful and it's yeah. i've taught i've taught a lot of classes at this point now and um i love like seeing i just taught a class last summer in up in maryland where i grew up and somebody that i know up there just like really took off with it and she's been making she like made a bunch of brooms for the holidays and um, had a little stand that she, you know, set up right before Christmas time to sell her brooms. And she told me, she like reached out to me recently and was like, somebody contacted me and they asked if I could fix this broom for them. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I know how to do it. Can you offer me advice? And so I just love, like, I always tell my students too, like, if you ever run into any, you know, questions or problems, like, please just reach out to me. Like, I just really want to, I want to see people thrive and and hopefully go on and continue sharing this craft with others because that's that's like how it's meant to be passed. Definitely. Yeah. And it's a sweet offering too because it's not every day you meet a broom maker. No. And it's not like a usual thing we hear of or even if you've heard of it, it's not like you have one in every community, <laughs> you know? Right. There is a botanical element to broom making in the broom corn, which is a plant matter, is used to make the broom part. And then you have wood for the handles, et cetera. There's more to it than that. But I was just curious, are you growing your own broom corn? You have sources for it because you probably use a lot. And then also, I know you have a love for botanicals in general and all of that. So how would you wrap all that up, the botanicals in your life? You know, that's a vague question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. I'm going to get around to answering all of it, but I'm going to kind of start at the beginning. I feel like my entryway into, you know, I spoke a little bit of just about my love of the natural world through, yeah, through growing up in a rural, rural place and um, sort of having this love and interest in indigenous cultures. And, and within that, there is an element of being so interested in learning about plants, you know, Growing up with so many incredible plants around me, I just had such a desire to, to have relationships with them, you know, to like, instead of looking out and seeing a sea of green, be like, oh, I know I can call you by name and I know you and I know what you're used for medicinally and just to have a sense of these beings. So that's actually what led me to move to Western North Carolina when I was 19 was I got an opportunity to apprentice at Red Moon Herbs, which is a herbal medicine company that's still around, but it used to be at a community, intentional community called Earth Haven Eco Village. And so when I was 19, I moved to this intentional community and I first started in the apothecary there, just like filling orders and bottling the medicines, which like I can still remember just like the, the smells and the experience of being in that place. And then I moved to actually going out in the field and harvesting the medicines and like really having one on one interactions with the actual plants. And so that has just like, I feel like that's informed so much of my life. From there, like I grew into the earth skills community and just like learning more about how to work with, you know, learning more about plants and then learning more about how to work with these just natural materials in creating and crafting. So all that to say, yes, <laughs> broom corn is now like this, this big plant that I work with in my life. Broom corn is a variety of sorghum. It is really easy to grow here. I would like to move into having all of it sourced, more of it sourced and grown in this area. I had a farmer, a farmer friend grow a plot for me last year. And yeah, it was definitely a learning experience. It's easy to grow, but the processing of it is quite labor intensive. There's a process that's done called tabling. So it gets to a certain height and you literally like lay, you kind of crisscross and like bend the stalks down. So they're like resting on each other flat, like a table so that the broom corn material will dry straight or also cutting it down and just putting it in a barn to dry. And so we did that. And, you know, the portion that you use for a broom, that's like the, has the nice fibrous material on it 
is called the hurl. And so what I found was that the hurl from that prop was like all kind of different sizes and a lot of it was too short to use. And so not like a reliable crop for me to use for the entire, you know, my entire year's worth of broom corn needs. So right now I source it from a supplier, but I really hope over the years to kind of get that process down or to find somebody that's able to really grow a large amount and dry it for me and, you know, and maybe even do some workshops on this is how to grow broom corn and let's have a party at like a work party and process it. And then I'll teach y'all how to make a broom. You know, that's the sort of learning that I feel really inspired and excited to to offer. And then I also, I also just have a love of, I have a love of beauty. I love figuring out how can we work with certain dried flowers and herbs, you know, that have their own just magical qualities to them and weave them into the brooms that we make. You know, maybe these brooms will be a little bit more decorative or used for ritual or magic making or, you know, whatever you wish. But yeah, I love, I, I've been experimenting a lot with just like learning what plants work really well to stitch into the brooms as well. So, Well, that's one thing you talk about is, I'm going to quote you, a fierce devotion to the beauty of the ordinary. And mm -hmm. it's true that a broom is considered an ultimately ordinary <laughs> implement. Yeah but is used so, so, so much. And also if it's made by hand or made by you, or you have special elements in it, it makes your ordinary cleaning and cleaning's never over. It's a fact of life, <laughs> like definitely more special. I like how you think about it that way. Mm. In which ways do you believe it's healing to make things with our hands? This kind of ties into, you know, this quote that you just that you just shared of the fierce devotion to the beauty of the ordinary. You know, I really love creating opportunities in our lives for presence. I feel like there's so many, yeah, there's so many distractions in our modern life. There's so many things that pull us out of the present moment. This is really what I love about one, like handcrafted items, uh, sweeping with a handcrafted broom that is just like, maybe like, creates an opportunity for pause or creates an opportunity for slowing down and really being intentional about the work that we're doing. And so the same is true with working with our hands. You know, I feel like when, I mean, at least this is true for me. And when I teach classes, this is, this is usually what I see from my students and hear from my students as well. Like it's an opportunity to take us out of the hustle and bustle of our everyday life and just slow down and embrace this quality of really it's innocence, you know? It's like, I mean, through having children and like I also work with children on a regular basis, actually teaching handcrafts. I love the quality of just childlike innocence that happens for any person when you're learning a new skill because it's an opportunity for us to be a beginner again, to just like, have our eyes open to a whole new world and a whole new way of doing things. Yeah. So I just, I just love that. I love that quality of innocence and play. You can tell by how you're talking about it and the look on your <laughs> face. You really love it very much. <laughs> but it's so fun. I love how you're wrapping it up with one word that's innocent. That's great. It is. It's like a moment of delight. It's a delightful feeling. It is. Like, how do we create more of that in our life? Cause that's, what's going to create, that's just like, what's going to create joy. And yeah. Like a good feeling generator. <laughs> yes. More, more of that. <laughs> this next question is really might overlap quite a bit with your answer of the last question, mm -hmm. which is what does slow craft mean to you? There are all these things about fine art versus craft and food and fashion and slow food and slow fashion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just curious your thoughts about, that within the context of the things you do and way you think about things. Yeah, it's all it's all tied in together. For me, slow craft means crafting with intention. You know, especially when I'm I think about the height of, you know, which I just came out of this, like the height of the big crafting season, like right before the holidays, where I'm just making a bunch of inventory for markets and things. And I feel like this is the best, this is like the ideal time for me to really pause and drop in with 
just the magic of the work that I'm doing, you know, rather than like just be trying to bust out like a whole bunch of brooms for production because I'm just needing to make money. You know, it's all about the mentality. It's like, okay, I like to take moments of pause where I'm just envisioning, I wonder who's going to be sweeping with this broom. Like, I wonder if this will be a gift for somebody, if it's going to be hanging on somebody's wall, if somebody will use it every day, what will this mean to somebody? I also just really believe, I believe in the magic of everything. And so I believe that sort of the energy and the intention and the prayers that I am holding, that I resonate with in the moment that I'm making this object, this broom, that's going to transfer over to whoever is the recipient of this. So how to, just this question of how to really slow down and be intentional with the things that we're creating so that we can spread that magic and that vibration on to the next person. Because you are putting you into it. And then yeah. there's that feeling in it when it gets passed to somebody else. That's definitely not the same as a machine, like at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, a human made this with their hands. I you wonder just what can feel doing. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also I think about part of an aspect of my work is going out into the forest and for my long handled sweeper brooms or cobweb brooms, like harvesting the handles. So it's really taking opportunity to, and I do this when I'm harvesting herbs too, to just slow down and to thank these beings, you know, to recognize, wow, this is a, this is a sapling that's growing that could grow into a tree if I let it be here, thanking it for its life, you know, and just like really, yeah, just having reciprocity woven into the way that I relate to these, these beings. And that's, I think also one of the beauties of hearing a little more of the story of your materials also in terms of anyone purchasing one of your brooms or even taking a class, you know, it takes time. That part takes time. And just like you're saying for the broom corn, it's not that easy to grow and get it. even just the process of making it flat. Like we take the flatness for granted. Mm. We take it all for granted because there's yeah. brooms all around, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so to hear more about that, like, wow, yeah, there's, there's a lot in, in it, you know? And so you have some slowness that's kind of forced <laughs> into the process because of just the collecting of materials also. Yeah. How do you value that? You know, and I, I think about too, part of this last year, my garden, predominantly what I grew in my garden was flowers from seed that I know would be good to use in broom, like that I could dry, like a lot of celosias and coxcombs and straw flowers. And I love how it's like all, it's like all woven into my entire life. It's not just like this business is separate. This is like what I do for my work. How do I feed myself and also feed others through just like the you know, finding those opportunities and outlets for joy. I mean, I get to see your work an average of once a year. Yes. And that's really fun <laughs> because there's this time in between and the different phases you're going through. And me too, you, we both are doing it. And when you're talking about the dried flowers, it's like, I'm just, I can't wait to see what you do with them. Cause I'm just imagining these, like, who knows what you're going to do. There's so many opportunities. What has been one of your biggest struggles when it comes to staying on your creative path? I would say, you know, I come from a background of for a number of years, I made my living through doing administrative work for other people, you know, through bookkeeping or yeah, doing registration, you know, organizing events and whatnot. And so I have this very sort of like I can live in that world, you know, and I, yeah, I know how to work hard. I know how to structure things, but I used to try to schedule time for my creative process and I'm learning more and more like that just isn't how it works, you know, but like finding this balance between like, okay, this is what I'm doing for my living. This is how I'm making my money. This is how I'm supporting my family. And so how to find the balance between doing all of those things that for the creative person, maybe are less exciting, like all of, yeah, just all of the ins and outs of running a business, doing social media, updating my website, you know, paying taxes, whatever it is like the balance between that and just allowing space for the creative process for new ideas to be born. I think that's the biggest challenge. And, you know, in this last year, I separated from my partner and really made this big leap to, okay, I'm doing my business for real. This is I'm choosing this path. I'm choosing this creative path to support me and my family and my girls, because this is what 
feels true and authentic to me. This is what's lighting me up. This is how I wish to create the world. And so it's scary, you know, it's scary because I'm not just getting a paycheck from somebody else. Like, okay, I have to make my way. I have to like really create my own opportunities. And it's also the way that I do my art. And I think a lot that a lot of artists do it. It's like sharing a piece of my inner life and my inner world and my soul. And so there's a vulnerable aspect to it of, oh, is what I'm creating when I'm creating really for me, when I'm creating art that speaks to me and who I am, are other people going to like it? Yeah. So those are all very real, valid things. The the fear is real. Yeah. (laughs) Move through it. You know, that's, that's life. And that's how new doorways open through that pathway of, of trust. Yeah. And it's balancing that the fear is there, which totally makes sense. It's a big, big, big thing to be paying your bills with things from your own hands. It's a really big thing. And balancing that with this excitement of the unknown. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and then also there is some courage in there. You have to have some courage in there to really go for it. And you clearly are going for it. Thanks. I'm I'm going for it. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, we'll see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about your, you've got some classes coming up. Um, I'm sure people will be curious to hear more about that. And also, so you have some other projects coming up. Tell us about what's coming up to 2023. Yeah. So I've got some classes on the calendar. I just scheduled some classes for January through March. And so I have a couple of whisk broom classes that are coming up, evening classes right around the Asheville area is where I'm teaching out of right now. So if you go on my website, it's handmadebrooms.com. You can easily find my class page there. In all my classes, we make two brooms. The next class, we make four brooms. And then I've got a sweep full length sweeper broom class coming up in March. And so I learned after teaching that initial sweeper broom class that this is more of an advanced class. And so I like folks to take one of the whisk broom classes first before jumping on board to that. And I'd like to share too, there's sort of a ritual component to my classes as well. You know, I come from a background of having been involved in a lot of circles, especially women's circles. And I really love creating opportunities just for people to connect and to drop in as well. So my classes usually start with a short meditation and just an opportunity to share intentions, just as a way of rooting us and grounding us in the space and the presence and sort of creating the container. And then I'm excited to share too, that I'm going to be sort of facilitating, curating the women's rewilding weekend for wild abundance. So that's a four day weekend, one in June and one in September, I believe, end of September. So it's going to be an opportunity really for women to gather over the course of four days in these beautiful mountains and just reconnect with each other and the land through craft and ceremony and altar tending and wild foods and learning about the plants and herbal medicine. It's going to be a really, and brew making, if I didn't say that, of course. (laughs) So it's going to be a really rich experience and weekend. So yeah, I'm super stoked to be sort of curating that experience. And then it's definitely in the cards for me to be getting an online class coming up. I've been in process of talking with a friend about filming. So I have so many people that ask me from all over this country and other countries, I'd love to take your class, but I don't live in the area. How do I do that? And I've been sort of resistant to the Zoom class thing, though it's possible, but really like I'm looking towards filming an online class so people can purchase a materials kit from me and then just learn at their own pace. That's exciting stuff. That's all exciting stuff. Good stuff. (laughs) (laughs) It's a fun feeling to be excited for the new year and, you know, have things to look forward to. I had a couple thoughts when you were just talking about what you're working on. One is how nowadays we can mix kind of old timey natural living with digital internet things to still be able to live in the country or live rurally or (laughs) live simply. And that's a funny paradox. (laughs) It is, but it's a blessing, you know, and there's so many people that don't, that live in cities or, you know, don't have an opportunity to have access to the amazing people or resources that we do living rurally and 
you know, I mean, you know, living around Brasstown, just there's such a vibrant community of people that just know incredible skills. And it's easy to take that for granted when you're just immersed in it. But yeah, just remembering that there's there's so many people that don't have access to that. And so being able to even just sharing a spark of inspiration or even just sharing, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's many people that don't even know you can make, you know, that have never thought about making their own broom. Yeah. So it's just like, you know, allowing it to be an, an opening of thought. Speaking of inspiration, mm-hmm. <laughs> this is a question I ask everyone because it's just fun to hear the answer. What is filling up your inspiration cup these days? I've been really lit up by breath work lately. There's a woman that lives on the land where I live who's a breath work facilitator and just sort of using that as a way of opening up my world and just sort of healing, you know, as a therapeutic tool. I've also been, for the past couple of years, I've had this study group with a couple of women in my community where we get together and contemplate the this work of Richard Rudd called the Gene Keys. And they're doing this, be- it's called a Venus Sequence Retreat right now. So if I could describe this work, it's really like, you know, it has sort of roots in astrology, human design, if you're familiar with that, but it's an opportunity to sort of like a map of our soul and our purpose here on this earth. There's a lot of different audios for contemplating the different gene keys that make up our own unique charts. And so I like it because it's really accessible. It just inspires me to really think in in new ways about myself and the way that I approach and interact with the world and maybe some of my shadow qualities and maybe some of the, yeah, the ways that I'm moving into, into growth and my own evolution. So you're also doing that in the company of friends, you're saying. I am. Yeah. 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 Once a month we get together. So so that's fun too. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's always nice having a tool that you like that guides you through understanding yourself better. <laughs> it is. I feel like it's so necessary for life. Do you have any last words of encouragement for everybody out there just doing the best they can to fold creativity into their daily lives? Yeah, I would say just like allow yourself to really go for the things that light you up. I think so often when we're, you know, maybe when we're unfulfilled or overwhelmed and we want a shift in our lives, there's a tendency. I know that I can have this tendency sometimes to just think big. I need to make a huge shift and I really want to do this thing, but it's inaccessible to me. And how am I ever going to make that happen? And then nothing changes. So, you know, how do we make small changes that really add up over time? So like, yeah, this is just like really interwoven into my whole business, you know, the whole sort of vision behind my business rhythm and rituals. How do we make these small changes, subtle changes in our daily lives that just bring more fulfillment and wholeness? And so maybe that looks like, okay, I want to commit to, I'm interested in exploring art, but I don't know what that looks like. Well, maybe it's like, okay, Once a week for a half an hour, I'm going to just draw or once a day for five minutes, I'm just going to look up a YouTube video, even on this technique for drawing, you know, making it accessible so that it's something that because like once you start, that's the hardest part. The hardest part is always starting. So just allow yourself a doorway to open to really enter in and then the creative process will really guide you from there. I love the image of put your hand on the door and just open it up. Yeah. Even if it's just like a little bit of a crap, you know, just slowly every day, like one day it's going to be wide open. Whereas, you know, it, it might feel closed now. If you'd like to be in touch, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fane House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards from my watercolor originals, I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You will also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If this all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly forward slash Fainhouse to sign up. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. You can find this link, as well as links for each person I interview, in the show notes of each episode. Thanks so much to Emily for joining us today, and thanks so much to you for listening. I'm Annie Fain Barillon, and I'll leave you with a quote for the day. 
The world is full of magic things, patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. W.B. Yeats.